the many ideas which Judaism has bequeathed to the world, Messianism is one of the most influential. Judaism probably did not actually invent Messianism. Analogies to the idea have been found in other cultures, for example, in the classical Greek myth of the Golden Age, first adumbrated by Hesiod in his works and days. Though in origin this referred, strictly speaking, to a lost primordial past, when humanity lived in peace, prosperity, and freedom from sin, some, chafing under the present sorry state of their world, longed for a return of that golden time. The young Virgil is a case in point. In his fourth eclogue, he sang of a newborn child who would bring back the age of gold. Christians, trained in the classics, could not resist seeing here a pagan prophecy of the birth of Christ, and so easily merged the restored golden age with the messianic age of their Bibles. But the dominant idea behind the classical myth was a deteriorationist view of history, the inexorable decline of the generations. In Virgil, the return is a poetical trope, neatly turned to flatter his patron, not an eschatological doctrine. And in any case, he got the idea, so he says, from the Sibylline oracles, specifically the Cumaean Sibyl, so some influence from Judaism cannot be entirely ruled out. Those of you who know anything about the obscure Sibylline oracles will know that there is a Jewish influence on these texts. So the possibility that Jews influenced Virgil is not entirely out of the question. There is good evidence, however, that some pagans in antiquity looked forward like some Jews, but independently of them, to a restoration in the future of the primitive state of perfection which they believe humanity once enjoyed. And so it would be rash and unwarranted to claim a Jewish monopoly of this idea. Indeed, the idea's ultimate origins may lie deep within the human psyche, in a fundamental human longing for security, plenty, and justice. The potential for Freudian analysis is obvious. Nevertheless, there can be little doubt that the idea as it entered the European imagination had its primary origin in Jewish messianism, and through the political and cultural hegemony achieved by Europe through colonial expansion, it is in this form that it has become part and parcel of the discourse of humanity at large. Judaism, of course, did not achieve this vast influence on its own, but largely through two of its offspring, the first and foremost being Christianity, the archetypal messianic religion, and the second, Islam, which, though not so fundamentally messianic, embraced elements of Christian and Jewish eschatology. I do not think it would be an exaggeration to say that we are dealing here with one of the seminal religio-political ideas of history, one which continues to have a profound resonance in our world today. The messianic idea has been central to Jewish theology since late antiquity, and it is hard to conceive of any form of Judaism's manifestations today where it is not present in some shape or form. Reform Judaism in the 19th century certainly balked at traditional messianisms, nationalism and particularism, and sought to universalize it. But, as I shall argue at length in the third lecture, reform still stayed within the parameters of the messianic idea, and was in fact, somewhat paradoxically, picking up on a strand of thought which commended itself to some of the great rabbis in the Tanaitic and early Amoraic periods. Maimonides also had difficulties with Messianism, at least as traditionally conceived. He found its materiality and corporeality something of a strain. As a philosopher influenced by Greek thought, he found it hard to accept bodily resurrection, a common element of the end-time scenario of Jewish Messianism. 
How could it be seen as any kind of blessing or good that the soul, having shuffled off this mortal coil, should be shackled to it again in the messianic age? Yet he had little option but to embrace the idea because Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1 had put belief in the resurrection of the dead on a par with believing that Torah is from heaven. Those who denied either doctrine forfeited their share in the world to come. Maimonides was obliged, therefore, to conform and to include the resurrection of the dead in a somewhat <coughs> perfunctory fashion in his famous 13 principles of the Jewish faith, which were based on the Mishnah in Sanhedrin 10. Yet many suspected he did so through gritted teeth. His own view of the end of history somewhat truncates the messianic age. There is a re resurrection, but the resurrected state seems short-lived and starkly unmiraculous. Maimonides cannot wait to usher the redeemed soul into the eternal, disembodied state he calls the world to come, where beyond time it dwells eternally with God. Maimonides then, for all his qualms, also remained within the parameters of the messianic idea. Ordinary Jews, however, embraced it more wholeheartedly, and in the Amidah and other Jewish prayers, day in and day out, prayed for the coming of the Messiah. To repeat, the messianic idea is one of the cardinal doctrines of Judaism, and I doubt, I speak here as a historian of Judaism, whether we could classify as truly Jewish any position that totally denies it. But what do we mean? But what do we mean by messianism? It is surprising how little attention has been given to this question, though the definition of messianism is absolutely crucial to any analysis of the phenomenon. Such discussion as discussions as there have been tend, I think, to be superficial. Many get fixated on the figure of the Messiah, some arguing flatly that a text simply cannot be classified as messianic if it does not have a clearly defined, clearly named Messiah in it. That might seem very hard-headed and sensible, but it massively constrains the analysis. The point that has to be firmly grasped is that the Messiah is simply one of a number of possible eschatological agents of redemption. Where we need to start is with the theology of eschatological redemption. If we don't, then we will miss all sorts of important comparisons and contrasts. I use messianism rather loosely to denote a certain schema of eschatological redemption. And on this usage, it may even be possible and analytically imperative to include in the category a particular scenario of eschatological redemption that does not actually postulate an identifiable Messiah. We need to start with a theological deep structure of the messianic idea, not with its more visible surface and sometimes frothy manifestations. The deep structure of the messianic idea is made up, I would suggest, of four interlocking theological propositions. The first involves a particular doctrine of God. God not only made the world, but he continues actively to govern it and to work out his purposes within it. This leads directly to a second proposition, namely that history History in the sense of the sum total of what humans do over time is teleological. It is not going round in circles, but moving forward to a grand climax when the purposes of God will be realized. This in turn leads to a third proposition, namely that time and history will have an end. History is not just one damn thing after another, world without end. And God is the ultimate guarantor that it will come to an end. For a number of reasons, the end may be delayed, but come it finally will. And it will inaugurate the time which is most comprehensively known 
in our sources as the kingdom of God, the realization of God's purpose. That will lead to a transformation of the world which will mark the end of history as we know it. God will affect his purposes in history through agents. Indeed, he may work through one particular chosen agent, the Messiah, the anointed of the Lord. But the coming of the kingdom does not ultimately depend on anyone other than God. It is therefore inexorable. Fourthly and finally, implicit in the messianic concept of history is a sense of then and now. A contrast between this age and the age to come, between the imperfect and broken world in which we live today and the perfect world of tomorrow, when all imperfections will be removed and the world mended and restored. This temporal dualism between this age and the age to come is absolutely fundamental to messianism. It involves a strong theology of hope. Those who subscribe to the messianic idea are optimists at heart, though some, as we shall see, are more optimistic than others. However difficult the times may be through which they pass, all of them look forward with confidence to a time when all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Much messianic speculation concentrates on the transition between this age and the age to come, and some astonishingly elaborate scenarios have been concocted predicting what will happen at this crucial juncture of history. Scenarios painstakingly pieced together from scattered biblical references and old apocalypses, <coughs> augmented by overheated imaginations. The birth pangs of the Messiah, Armageddon, the Antichrist, the ingathering of the exiles, the resurrection of the dead, the coming of the Messiah, the re-establishment of the kingdom of Israel, the messianic banquet, the last judgment, and so on and so forth. Much has been written comparing and contrasting these de detailed scenarios. Indeed, many scholars see them as constituting the very stuff of messianism, but they do not, even though they bulk very large in some of the primary sources. The motifs can be and are understood and combined in a bewildering variety of ways. There is no standard detailed scenario, and it would be possible to admit almost all the individual motifs and still achieve a valid expression of the messianic idea. But what one cannot admit is the dualism of the ages, this age versus the age to come. That is non-negotiable. I would argue that any theological position which subscribes to these four propositions can be <coughs> meaningfully labeled messianic. So that's my, mess, that's my deep structure, which I call the messianic idea. That's the deep structure of this uh, idea. Within the parameters of this abstract theological framework, a number of concrete forms of messianism can be generated. <coughs> I will try to analyze some of these in detail in the subsequent lectures, and in the final lecture, offer a comprehensive classification, which is meant to embrace all forms of messianism that have appeared within that framework. But it will, I think, be useful for orientation for me to broach here some of the possibilities. So this is a kind of just broaching a few possibilities to get our discussion going. Messianism, messianisms can be classified according to the answer they give to the question of what is the locus or scene where they conceive the decisive redemptive action is taking place. Two main loci, lo, loci can be distinguished history and the spiritual realm. Where history is the scene, the coming of the kingdom is envisaged as an event or series of events that take place on the plane of history. This view is exemplified by those types of messianism which see the outcome of the messianic process as being a political entity, the reconstituted state of Israel, living in peace, prosperity and security, and ruled over by a king who may be super wise and super good, but who, know, who remains no more than a man among men. 
But it can equally be found in those forms of messianism which see the transformation of humanity as a whole and not just the people of Israel and the emergence worldwide of a just and God-fearing society as the goal of history. The latter view is more common in Christian messianism which has classically neutralized Jewish nationalism but it is not unknown, as we shall see, within Judaism as well. For example, in Reform Judaism, a point to which I shall return in the final lecture. The differences between these views are my, by no means negligible, and they have considerable practical consequences. I have no wish to play this down, but my basic point here is that for all their disagreements, both positions both the universalist and the nationalist, posit history and society as the locus of redemption. It is a process that primarily affects humankind. Historical messianisms can then be either nationalist or universalist, but they divide among other lines as well. They can divide according to what they hold up as the model of the redeemed human condition. Basically, three models are invoked. The Paradise model, the Davidic Kingdom model, and the Utopian model. The Paradise model envisages humanity returning to the state it enjoyed in the Garden of Eden before our first parents were banished for disobedience and condemned to wander the earth, resting a livelihood from the ground by the sweat of their brow and bearing children in pain. The end site matches the ord site. This model is favored by the universalists. Second, the Davidic kingdom model holds up the rule of David as a period of perfection in Israel's history and looks for the restoration of the conditions that prevailed then. The Davidic kingdom is to be sure romanticized and idealized, its faults, which scripture takes no trouble to conceal, forgotten. But basically, a return to the Davidic state is what is desired. This model is probably to some degree influenced by the terms of the Sinai Covenant. The supreme blessing which God promised Israel if she obeyed his Torah was that she would dwell in peace and security in her own promised land. The nearest Israel ever came to enjoying that reward was under David and Solomon. So in a sense, by looking for a restored Davidic kingdom, this view is at the same time anticipating the fulfillment at last of the Sinai Covenant. This model is inherently particularist and nationalist and dovetails closely with a belief in a Davidic Messiah, a remote descendant of David who will rule over the restored Davidic kingdom. The utopian model sees the age to come as qualitatively different from anything that has been in the past. It will transcend in glory anything that has been seen before, whether in David's time or even in paradise. The utopian model is compatible with either the nationalist or the universalist position, though it seems marginally more comfortable with the latter. It also tend because, and it also tends to embrace nature as well as society as the locus of redemption, since it is often only through the transformation of nature that the utopian <coughs> model can find an adequate way of expressing itself. The fertility of the land, for example, will be miraculous. Crops will grow so speedily and abundantly that the reaper will follow in the footsteps of the so the sower. There are large doses of supernaturalism and magical realism in utopian messianism, but everything still happens on the human plane. Of these three models, the first two are backward-looking and nostalgic. They see the future as a return to an idealized past. The third is forward-looking, radical, and progressive. It holds that the final state will transcend anything that the world has known before. True perfection has never been achieved. It will only come to pass in the future. The utopian model is comparable with either nationalist or universalist messianisms, though where the transformation of nature is involved, it would seem to be more consonant with universalism. 
since it is implausible, though not inconceivable, that transformed nature would be confined only to the Holy Land. Though we haven't the time to pursue it here, we should note in passing that profoundly different religious psychologies are involved in these three models. Looking back and looking forward are psychologically very, very um, different um, standpoints. So, historical messianisms um, can be divided into universalist or uh, particular stroke nationalist. But they can also divide as to whether or not they hold the kingdom will come gradually or suddenly. The distinction here is very clearly articulated in Christian messianism. So let me begin my analysis here and then move on to Judaism where the same distinction is also found, though seldom there adequately recognized and articulated by modern scholarship. In Christianity, this involves the well-known distinction between premillennialism and postmillennialism. I would get into really good detail here. <laughs> You're gonna learn a lot if you don't know this already. The decisive question is this. Does the coming of the Messiah, that is in Christianity, the second coming of Christ, happen before or after the inauguration of the final historical state conceived of as a millennial reign of Christ and the saints? The implications of the answer one gives to this question are surprisingly profound. In premillennialism, the second coming of Christ inaugurates the millennium. It is a dramatic, <coughs> catastrophic intervention into history by the agent who will bring the kingdom. A rupture is posited between the end of this age and the beginning of the age to come. The end of this age will be a period of disaster and persecution of the saints, often known in Christian eschatology from the book of Revelation as the Great Tribulation. Because the agent of redemption is overwhelmingly Christ, other human, human agency is sidelined. There is little the saints can do to assist the coming kingdom of, of the kingdom. Their role is to keep themselves unspotted from the world, to withdraw from a society and a world order that is under the wrath of God. Though Christian premillennialism has found for itself in recent times an aggressive political voice, and an active political role in the states, it is traditionally apolitical, and the logic of its position seems rather to demand this. In postmillennialism, by way of contrast, the kingdom comes gradually, like the dawning of the day, and Christ returns as the seal and culmination of a process that has already effectively been achieved. There is no catastrophic intervention in history, no great tribulation. Postmillennialism conceives of messianic agency in a very different way from premillennialism. The kingdom is in fact inaugurated by the spread of the gospel, and that leaves an important role for the saints to play in working actively to bring it in. The church is the kingdom in embryo. And it is the universal triumph of the church which will finally give birth to the messianic age. Postmillennialism is intrinsically activist. And by interpreting the gospel in a broad and generous way, liberal Christian postmillennialists have often found themselves at the vanguard of movements for social justice. Christian socialism owes must much to Christian postmillennialism. Now, you may spot, if you've been wide awake, that there is a tension between messianic agency as conceived of in post-millennialism and the deep structure of the messianic idea, as I posited it earlier. I suggested that one of the fundamental elements of the messianic idea is that the ultimate guarantor that the kingdom will come is God, since that kingdom represents the outworking of his purpose in history. But if the coming of the kingdom relies so heavily on the church preaching the gospel, what happens if the church falls down on the job? Will God's purpose be frustrated? The short answer has to be, no, it can't be. Christian postmillennialists, while reluctant to say anything 
that will relieve Christians of a sense of duty to bring about a better world, have ultimately to concede that the coming of the kingdom depends on God. They square the circle usually by seeing God as working through the church in this age, through the spirit, to ensure that Christians don't ultimately fail to deliver. They also, by the way, usually see the millennial reign of Christ as a spiritual reign in and through the triumphant church before he returns in person to institute the last judgment. Christian premillennialism and Christian postmillennialism, though both outworkings of the same messianic idea, are like chalk and cheese. They engender two very different religious psychologies. Premillennialists tend to regard the second coming as imminent. Though they hold that in the end all shall be well, they manifest a deeply pessimistic streak. Christ will return when society has reached the nadir of corruption and evil. And premillennialists are not hard to convince that wherever or whenever they live, society is going to hell in a handcart before their very eyes. They grimly scan each new disaster and ask if it is the conclusive sign the end is near. Postmillennialists, however, do not live life on the tiptoe of expectation that the second coming is at hand. They can always persuade themselves that there's still work for them to do, that society has not reached anything like the perfection that is the mark of the millennium. So the second coming cannot be all that at hand. But they are profoundly optimistic that there will inevitably, though there will inevitably be ups and downs, retreats as well as advances, the inexorable direction is towards improvement. Things can only get better. <coughs> I have spent some time expounding Christian <coughs> pre- and post-millennialism because though these two positions represent two major variations of the Messianic idea, they are not well understood within the scholarly literature. Still less understood is the fact that their basic structures are replicated within Jewish Messianism. <coughs> the premillennialist tradition is represented by many of the old Jewish apocalypses, and it gets picked up again in the rabbinic movement in the late Talmudic era, and is then continued in most of the scenarios of the end emanating from the texts of the apocalyptic revival in Judaism of the 7th to 9th centuries. The Messianic age will be inaugurated suddenly and catastrophically. The redemption will come at a time when the face of the generation is as the face of a dog. That is to say, when society is rotten to the core and public decency and morality have reached their lowest ebb. It will come a time at a time of particular suffering and trouble for the Jewish people, a period sometimes referred to in the sources as the birth pangs of the Messiah. There is nothing one can do to force redemption. God will bring it in his own good time. Israel's calling is to suffer patiently and pray that the Messiah will come speedily in our days. In post-millennialist Jewish messianism, by way of contrast, the kingdom is brought by Jews observing the Torah. If all Israel would repent and keep the Torah for one day, the Messiah would come. There is no catastrophe envisaged here. The Messianic age will arrive like, arise like the dawn, rising over the Golan, as the famous Talmudic story of the two rabbis walking in the valley of Arbala has it. As I shall argue in the final lecture, this post-millennialist Jewish messianism was typical of rabbinic thought in the Tanaitic and early Amoraic periods, and it was vigorously reworked by Reform Judaism in modern times. Now, these forms of messianism, which I have mentioned so far, are all varieties of historical messianism. For all their differences, and the differences are huge, they have one fundamental thing in common. They envisage the locus or scene of the redemption as being primarily history. But there are forms of messianism that see the primary locus of redemption as being the unseen world, 
The forces that have to be defeated are invisible and spiritual. The flaw that has to be mended is in the structure of the cosmos, or even within the Godhead itself, not in society. The Messiah who has to address this problem has to be armed with spiritual weapons for his work is spiritual. <coughs> One way of addressing this problem is to make him a supernatural figure, a divine agent from the spirit world, like Melchizedek at Qumran or Jesus. But he can also be a mortal man, provided he has enormous spiritual power and can operate effectively in that unseen realm. This kind of mystical messiah is exemplified by Abraham Abu Lafia, Isaac Luria, Shabtai Tzvi, and Moses Chaim Lutzato. It was by their titanic spiritual struggles, their mighty Yehudim, that these figures were seen as mending the world and bringing the re redemption, not by leading armies and fighting military campaigns, but by engaging in spiritual gymnastics. These figures are deeply problematic if one takes too narrow and prescriptive a view of Jewish messianism. They don't seem to do anything that the Messiah is supposed to do. And yet for sure they claim to be Messiahs, or at least were seen as Messiahs by their followers. How can this be? Many of these people were charismatic personalities, but not all. Some were unprepossessing to the outside eye. Lutzato is a case in point. Would anyone outside Lutzato's small devoted circle of followers have imagined in their wildest dreams that this scholarly young man would save the world? Yet like Clark Kent, <laughs> yet like Clark Kent morphing into Superman, Lutzato was regarded as morphing into a spiritual superhero when he entered the spirit realm to do his redemptive work. You don't have to be a fantasist to be a mystical messiah, but it does help. <laughs> we simply have to accept that this is a radically different form of messianism from the historical, because it defines the condition to be rectified differently, and consequently cites the locus of the action differently. But this mystical messianism still lies, I would argue, within the parameters of the deep structure of the messianic idea, which I outlined earlier. Now, all this at the moment is very abstract. I hope by the end of the lectures to have put some firm flesh on these bare bones. But it's important at this stage of the argument to grasp what I am trying to do. I am trying to create a taxonomy of messianism. That taxonomy covers effectively all those forms of messianism that have emerged within the parameters of the deep structure of the messianic idea which I outlined earlier. The taxonomy, though unfaired from existing sources and movements, is essentially ideal typical. That is to say, actual messianisms which have emerged do not always fit exactly into my ideal types. They are not always pure types. Different, sometimes contradictory elements can be combined in dizzying and bewildering ways. For example, the eschatological redemption in the Dead Sea Scrolls seems to take place simultaneously in the historical and the spiritual realms in a complex process of three-dimensional chess. Nevertheless, I will hope to convince you by the end that my ideal typical instrument is an effective analytical tool that helps us find our way through the chaos of the actual messianic traditions. My approach, as you will have noticed, is massively synchronic, and that will doubtless be seen as a weakness. My evidential base derives indiscriminately from texts and movements stretching from late biblical times to the present day. How can I justify such a breathtaking synthesis? I can only justify it theoretically if I see these traditions as the outworkings over time 
of the potential residing in the deep structure of the messianic idea. And that assumption only makes sense in turn if I see Judaism as forming a coherent theological system, created and developed by an evolving religious community, which in broad fidelity to its religious heritage has adapted certain core beliefs to its changing historical circumstances. I do hold this view of Judaism, as those of you who sat through my Introduction to Judaism course will know when I see some <laughs> in the audience today. The essentialism involved in this approach I know is deeply unfashionable. It would take us too far afield to discuss the issues here. Suffice to say that I'm well aware of the problems and believe I have reasonable answers to them. My approach is synchronic, but I would not deny the importance of the diachronic perspective. I think of myself as fundamentally an historian, and history will feature in a subsidiary way in my analysis. To orient you, orientate you and set my synchronic analysis in a wider context, let me remind you very briefly here of the main phases in the history of Jewish messianism and the literature and movements on which my observations are based. So hold on tight, we're going to go through 2,000 years of history here very quickly. In considering the vexed question of the origins of Jewish messianism, we need to keep in mind the deep structure of the messianic idea, which I outlined earlier. <coughs> Elements of this can be found scattered throughout the Hebrew Bible. The belief that God is the moral governor of the world and the Lord of history is widespread in Tanakh. The concept of a Messiah who will come in the future and put all things right is found in both pre- and post-exilic traditions and seems to be the outworking of prophetic promises to the house of David and ideals of kingship most clearly articulated in the royal psalms. There are numerous passages dating from the exilic and post-exilic periods which talk in more general terms of the future restoration both of the people of Israel and more generally of the world. We should also not forget the concept of the day of the Lord which is clearly some sort of dramatic intervention of God in history in judgment. All these traditions were later gathered into scenarios of the end, but although they are highly suggestive on their own, none of them individually is for certain a full expression of the messianic idea on my definition of the term, and we must avoid reading too much into them individually or prematurely harmonizing them into a coherent theology. The messianic idea in its fullness only seems to emerge in the late Second Temple period. The book of Daniel marks a decisive moment in its recorded history, and why it does so is that Daniel fits the future redemption clearly into a comprehensive historical schema which makes it, the future redemption, the end of history. <laughs> Note, for example, the vision of the great statue in Daniel 2. That explicitly divides history into a succession of four uh, world empires, but in the time of the fourth empire, quote, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall this kingdom be left to another people, it shall crush all those kings and break kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Messianism is an important element of the apocalyptic literature of the Second Temple period, of which Daniel is, historically speaking, the most important example. But it is not confined to them. We find strong messianic passages in Ben Sira and the Psalms of Solomon and in many of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is hard not to see this outburst of messianism as having something to do with the Hellenistic crisis and the rise of the Hasmonean state. But the relationship is somewhat obscure and problematic. The Hasmoneans themselves, at least in the literature that can be seen as propaganda for their point of view, <coughs> primarily 1 and 2 Maccabees, do not make any obvious messianic claims though there is in their propaganda a strong appeal to the idea of restoration. 
Perhaps their rule was so obviously flawed that any suggestion that they had established the Messianic kingdom simply lacked credibility. However, the raising of national consciousness which they undoubtedly achieved may have fueled speculation and hope for a more perfect messianic redemption. If they were not the redemption, might they be at least the beginning of the redemption? Certainly they were implicated in some way in the first great flowering of apocalypticism in Judaism and were to some degree both a product of it and a stimulus to its future development. There was a further flowering of apocalyptic right at the end of the Second Temple period. And it had to do with the dramatic events surrounding the destruction of the Temple. One way of coping was, uh, with this was to look forward to an imminent restoration and the coming of the Messiah. The signature texts of this second flowering of apocalyptic are two Baruch and four Ezra. Again, the question arises as to whether or not the first revolt itself, which led to the destruction, was in any sense a messianic war. I find it hard to believe that some did not see it in these terms. The fourth philosophy, and particularly the zealots, were, if not the instigators of the revolt, those who kept it going <coughs> long after it had become a forlorn hope. I think Josephus is basically right about this. It is hard now to know what made the zealots tick. Like many guerrilla movements, they were not all that articulate and have not left behind a literature that sets out coherently and elegantly their philosophy. They were following clearly in the footsteps of the Maccabees in taking up arms, arms to create an independent Jewish state. But it is not clear whether this was linked in their minds to messianic ideals. I think it might well have been. Certainly if J.T. Millick is right that the Qumran Covenanters at the very end of the Second Temple period moved politically in the direction of the Zealots, then the Dead Sea War Cycle may well open a window into Zealot ideology. If it does, then that ideology was strongly Messianic. What the Zealots may represent is a nationalism married to a messianic ideology with a strong activist ethos prepared to use violence to bring the kingdom, a form of messianism which Judaism was later to reject, but which was revived in our own times by political Zionism. I will return to this point later. Certainly messianism linked to armed rebellion was a feature of the second revolt against Rome in 132 to 135, and here we have unquestionably a warrior messiah, Shimon Bar Kozila, who was known to his followers by the messianic title Bar Kokhba. But we should not forget that the most important Jewish messianic movement of the Second Temple period in world historical terms, the followers of Yeshua ben Yosef, emphatically rejected violence and even direct political action. My kingdom, he reportedly said, is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. And yet, the Christian spiritualized form of messianism can equally be counted as an expression of the messianic idea. The rabbinic movement, which came to dominate the Jewish communities of Palestine in the post-70 period, learned a bit bitter lesson from the two disastrous wars against Rome and did all it could to dampen messianic activism. It did not, as I will argue later, abandon messianism as some suppose. Rather, it emphasized another route towards fulfilling mess messianic aspirations, namely the keeping of the mitzvot. It has often been noted that in the earliest strata of rabbinic literature, the Mishnah, the Tosefta, the early Amoraic materials in the Talmud, and the earliest levels of the Midrashim, there is very little reference to the vivid end time scenarios of the old apocalyptic literature. The older traditions were preserved in the rabbinic milieu, in important synagogue prayers such as the Amidah, and in traditions around the 9th of Av, Pesach, and Hanukkah. But it cannot be stressed enough that these are fundamentally not rabbinic traditions, 
but popular beliefs and customs which the rabbis knew and in which they tried to put their stamp. Towards the end of the Amoraic period, however, these traditions reappear with even great, ever greater frequency in rabbinic literature and are beginning to be taken seriously and quoted. The reasons for this need not detain us here, but probably it has something to do with the political triumph of Christianity under Constantine, what one rabbinic text described as the kingdom going over to heresy, to be note, and the eventual persecution which this brought down in the heads of the Jewish communities of the Middle East. This produced in the end an apocalyptic revival in Judaism which was given enormous fillet by the sudden rise of Islam and its swift and dramatic conquest of the Middle East. The apocalyptic revival seems to have begun a little before the rise of Islam. The opening salvo, as far as our record now goes, is fired by Sefer Eliyahu, which was probably composed in the 6th century CE. But many of the late Hebrew apocalypses date to the early Islamic period. Their arrival of Islam sparked apocalyptic and messianic speculation, not only in Judaism, but in Islam and Zoroastrianism, and finally, uh, sorry, in Judaism and uh, Zoroastrian, and finally within Islam itself. The apocalypt this apocalyptic movement was as vibrant and creative as that which occurred in Judaism in late Second Temple times, and its impact was no less important it undoubtedly sealed the revitalization of the messianic idea in mainstream Judaism. But the apocalyptic fervor died down, as apocalyptic fervor often does, when nothing much seems to happen. And although the Hebrew apocalypses, unlike Second Temple period apocalyptic, continued to be transmitted and read in mainstream Judaism, the development of the messianic idea moved in other directions. One of these was to be found in the philosophic tradition. Messianism by the early Middle Ages has unquestionably become a cardinal doctrine of Judaism and so couldn't be ignored. It was given extensive treatment by philosophers such as Saadia and even Maimonides. What the philosophers tended to stress was messianism as a political process leading to a state which would live up to the philosophic ideals of kingship, but which would simply act as a vestibule for the world to come, the final disembodied state of bliss that the righteous would enjoy. The mystical tradition, as opposed to the philosophic, took the messianic idea in a more spiritual direction by treating messianism as essentially a cosmic process. The concrete messianic language of the Tanakh, like the rest of its Agadot, concealed deeper mysteries and was symbolic of events that would take place primarily in the unseen spiritual realm. The Spanish Kabbalah was particularly energetic in this development and above all its masterpiece, the Zohar. Kabbalistic messianic speculation was intensified by the expulsion from Spain in 1492. It would be hard to overestimate the importance of this event. Between the fall of the temple and the Shoah, no catastrophe that befell the Jewish people can have had greater impact on the Jewish imagination and on Jewish thought than the expulsion from Spain. It is one of the turning points of Jewish history. It not only disrupted and brought to an end one of the most flourishing Jewish communities in history, but it created a theological crisis in Judaism, a crisis addressed powerfully in mystical terms by a group of Sephardi exiles who gathered in the little Galilean town of Safed in the 16th century, the most important of whom was, of course, Isaac Luria, the Ari. Lurianism was deeply messianic in its theology, but the theology was fundamentally mystical and spiritual. Lurianic ideas spread, and it was to some extent on the platform of Lurianism that the next great eruption of messianism in Judaism occurred, the Sabbatian movement of the mid-17th century. Shabtai Tzvi, 
engendered one of the most important messianic movements in the history of Judaism, the impact of which spread far beyond the Levant, where he himself operated, to the Jewish communities of Northern and Western Europe. In the heady decades of the 1660s and 70s, it engulfed the whole Jewish world. Shabtai is a deeply paradoxical figure who did paradoxical things, and he has gone down in Jewish history as the ultimate failed Messiah. Some of those who believed in him undoubtedly expected him ultimately to fulfill the role of a political Messiah. That was the role they expected the Messiah to perform. But his immediate circle, and he himself, saw his primary task as lying in the spiritual realm, in keeping with the mystical theology which underpinned his mission. Long after his conversion to Islam, and even after his death, the ghost of Shabtai haunted Judaism. Sabbateanism continued a shadowy underground existence in the 18th century, not only in such extreme and marginal movements as Frankism and Hasidism, but in the heart of the rabbinic establishment, in much more in such respectable figures as Jonathan Ibeschutz and Moses Chaim Lutzato. Hasidism, though it began as a marginal movement in the 18th century and was bitterly resisted by the rabbinic establishment, by the early 19th century had reached an uneasy but very real accommodation with rabbinism. In the 20th century this symbiosis continued and after World War II the influence of Hasidism on the Jewish community at large grew rapidly, particularly through the activities of Chabad. And it was in Chabad that the messianic idea which had been running through Hasidism, largely in subterranean channels, blasted to the surface in the 1990s in the figure of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the late Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the most impressive Jewish messiah since Shabtai Tzvi. The Rebbe is the latest manifestation of mystical messianism which dominated Judaism since 1492. But in the 19th century, other historical forces were pull pulling the development of Jewish messianism in a different direction, one that was to take it emphatically towards a re-engagement with, indeed, re-entry into history. <coughs> Those forces had all to do with the encounter of European Jewry and modernity, but that encounter resulted in two contradictory manifestations of historical <coughs> messianism. <coughs> the first was, as I've mentioned several times, a Jewish universalism exemplified classically in 19th century reform. Emphatically non-nationalistic, 19th century Jewish universalism was a child of the Jewish Enlightenment and the Jewish meeting with that secularized ghost of its own messianism, the liberal idea of progress, now scientifically underpinned by social Darwinism. The second contradictory manifestation of Jewish messianism was linked to the rise in the late 19th century of Jewish nationalism, and more specifically Zionism. Jewish nationalism arose largely among secularized Jews, but it was inevitable that it would, sooner or later, get tangled up with religious messianism. It was too much to expect that the two could be kept apart. Some Jewish traditionalists have, of course, seen Zionism as the negation of messianism, because it forces the redemption. I hope to discuss this a little more in a little more detail in my second lecture, and I discussed it at length last night at the community lecture, which some of you I know heard. Suffice to say here that I can see nothing in principle in Zionism that negates the messianic idea, and taking the long historical view, it is possible to see Zionism as reverting to the very old messianism of those Jews who in the distant past before the rabbis embargoed military solutions, took up arms to create a Jewish state. Over both these developments in modern times, inevitably hangs the dark cloud of the Shoah, calling into question the liberal idea of progress in terms which some sought, uh, liberal idea, in terms of which some sought to define the messianic kingdom as the inevitable goal of social 
devolution, and adding urgency to those who sought practical political solutions and a national homeland for the devastated Jewish people. Now, this is a rather breathless diachronic survey of Jewish messianism, but I hope it allows me to make two points. First, the messianic idea of Judea in Judaism is immensely flexible and dynamic and takes on a variety of forms. But second, the forms it takes are highly sensitive to historical events. Its relationship to history is complex and not easily read, but the relationship is unquestionably there. The old apocalyptists recognized this in their own way by reading the progress of the messianic redemption in the signs of the times. I'm nearly finished. Much has been written about messianism, and there's surely an element of chutzpah in supposing that, that this late in the day, I have anything new to contribute. That will be for you to decide. But I feel I must trespass on your patience long enough to say something about one earlier scholar whom I regard as my dialogue partner in the present enterprise. I refer to the great Gershom Sholem. Sholem's famous and justly influential essay on the messianic idea in Judaism, first appeared in English in 1971, is in my view the most important single study of Jewish messianism in recent times. He summarizes his position as follows, I quote, a totally different concept of redemption determines the attitude of messianism in Judaism and Christianity. What appears to the one as a proud indication of its understanding and a proud achievement of its message is almost unequivocally belittled and disputed by the other. Judaism in all its forms and manifestations has almost maintained a concept of redemption as an event that takes place publicly on the stage of history and within the community. It is an occurrence which takes place in the visible world and which cannot be conceived apart from such a visible appearance. In contrast, Christianity conceives of redemption as an event in the spiritual and unseen realm an event which is reflected in the soul, in the private world of each individual, and which reflects an inner transformation which need not correspond to anything outside." End of quote. Now, I've seen against my taxonomy, which I've revealed a little bit of, um, it should be immediately obvious that this statement of Sholem contains a very bold generalization. It essentializes a normative Jewish and a normative Christian messianism and sets them starkly off against each other. The normative Jewish messianism is of the historical type and more specifically, as becomes clear later in Sholem's essay, of the premillennial subtype. Jewish messianism, he writes later, is in its origins and by its nature, this cannot be sufficiently emphasized a theory of catastrophe. Normative Christian messianism, by way of contrast, has really no interest in history. It is focused on inwardness, on the spiritual realm. Does this stand up? I'm afraid if my taxonomy is correct, it does not. It is, to say the least, highly problematic. On the Christian side, Sholem has simply misunderstood the complexity of Christian messianism, the result of him having read the wrong sort of German theology, <laughs> too heavily influenced by pietism. It cannot be denied that he has accurately enough described some forms of Christian messianism. But although any form of Christian messianism will have a spiritual dimension to it, this does not mean that Christian messianism has necessarily abandoned history. But what of his generalization on the Jewish side? Here his knowledge is massive and first-hand, but the problems are no less severe. There is, as the taxonomy shows, many different forms of messianism within Judaism. On what ground does Sholem privilege one over the, the other? He really doesn't say. Isn't post-millennial Jewish messianism 
which is not in any way, shape, or form a theory of catastrophe, every bit as much Jewish as premillennial Jewish messianism. It is certainly advocated, as we shall see, by impeccable Jewish authorities. Sholem, of course, knows the varieties of Jewish messianism well and mentions them in the body of his essay, but rather implies that their later developments are somehow deviations from the norm under dubious external influences. Why should Sholem have been so keen to advocate this position in the way that he did? The answer becomes clear at the very end of his essay. He was a passionate Zionist, and he was anxious to root Zionism in Jewish tradition. He was not a religious Zionist, far from it, but it mattered to him that the return to the land which he witnessed in his own day, after the catastrophe of the Shoah, was seen as a fulfillment of the age-long yearnings of the Jewish people for statehood. Here, as elsewhere in his massive oeuvre, the theologian hiding behind the great historian shows his face. This will have to suffice by way of introduction to a complex subject. In the next lecture, tomorrow at the same time, same place, I will analyze in detail the forms of messianism which in my taxonomy, taxonomy are classified as historical and particular. In the third lecture, I will turn to those which are mystical, that is to say the forms of messianism which see the eschatological redemption as occurring primarily in the spiritual realm. In the final lecture, I will consider those forms of messianism which are historical and universalistic, forms which are often seen as neutralizations of traditional historical messianism. Having immersed you in some concrete texts, I will return to my taxonomy and present it more fully in all its glory. I will conclude with some remarks on the implications of my analysis for Jewish Christian dialogue. Thank you. Thank you.